Hey guys, Spudknocker here, as always, and today we're going to kick off a two-part series on BVR or Beyond Visual Range Combat in DCS World. This first video is all about defensive flying and how to evade and defeat various types of air-to-air -air missiles you will encounter in BVR combat in DCS World single player and multiplayer. We'll also discuss the differences between the single player and multiplayer environments as we go through how to defend against semi-active radar guided missiles, active radar guided missiles with special emphasis on the AIM-120C AMRAAM and SD-10, as well as forward aspect fired IR guided heat seekers as you close in on the merge. This is a long video, and if you'd rather skip around, check out the timestamps in the description or pinned in the comments below. So let's go ahead and get on into it guys. Okay guys, let's go ahead and get started with our first engagement here, teaching you guys how to evade and defeat semi-active radar guided missiles. Now this family of missiles includes those such as the R-27R and R-27ER carried aboard the MiG-29 and Su-27, as well as the AIM-7 Sparrow family of missiles, and some older Soviet bloc carried aboard the MiG-21, MiG-23, and MiG-25 within DCS World. Now, these are some of the easiest missiles to evade and defeat within DCS World, and sometimes they're called Beam Rider missiles because the launch aircraft has to keep an STT or single target track hard lock on the target throughout the entire flight path of the missile from launch through its flight path and into hitting the target itself. So all we have to do in order to trash this missile is to actually break the lock of the launch aircraft itself. Now we can do this through a couple different means such as using countermeasures like chaff, uh, notching the launch aircraft's radar, as well as through terrain masking, through diving down and hiding behind a mountain, diving down into a valley, or any of these tactics because they're all incredibly valid. Any tactic that makes sure that your aircraft makes it through the engagement safely is incredibly valid and works for you. So let's go ahead and take a look at our opposition for today. For our really sterile engagement here, we've got a Su-27 armed with two R-27ER missiles, and he is set to excellent for the AI, and his prime directive, based on the mission editor, so to speak, is to engage us and shoot these missiles at us. Now, the AI does fly pretty much like a human would in BVR, except for the fact that the AI tends to fly a pure pursuit throughout the entire engagement, keeping his nose on you and not building any lateral separation between you and the target. Now, this does tend to... Uh, mimic what new DCS world players will do in multiplayer when engaging in BVR combat, but just keep in mind that more experienced players in multiplayer combat are going to want to also build more of that lateral separation in order to better um, crank around and trash missiles through uh, energy tactics that way. So let's go ahead and hop into the office and get started. So we're in the office of our beautiful F-14 Tomcat here, and uh, of course we got our Spud Knocker skin on here with the VF-111 theme, which is always perfect. And we've got uh, Overlord here is telling, giving us a bra call of 314 for 90 at 15,000 hot for that Su-27 out here who wants to come out and kill us. So let's go ahead and get started. Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and bring ourselves around to a heading of 314 degrees and see if we can get this guy on our radar in order to better increase our situational awareness. That should be about 314 right there. Let's see if Jester can get him. There he is. Alright, so when we're first engaging in a BVR engagement, we, when we first get him on radar, we want to make sure that we're bringing him off our nose uh, 20 degrees Standard or more in order to build miles. lateral separation. So let's go ahead and pause it and take a look at the F-10 map and illustrate what I mean. So via the F-10 map, we can see here that that bandit, he is flying a pure pursuit onto us, and we're flying a more or less westerly heading coming out about right here. And so what we're doing here is we're building up lateral separation. We're flying this direction because if he were to launch a missile from anywhere in his flight path, come in here to intercept us, that missile is going to have to actually fly an intercept vector at us. And that's very, very important because if we flew simply a pure pursuit right onto him here, we have an incredibly high closure rate. We're making sure that that missile, that if he were to launch a missile at us, would uh, 
have a much, much lower flight time. It would have a much uh, shorter distance to travel in order to hit us, giving putting that missile at a high, high advantage. If you, if you, it's pretty much the same idea for evading SAM launches in my previous uh, ev SAM evasion video that I made not too long ago, which will be linked down in the des description below. Now, what we want to do here is we want to keep building that separation so that way that missile has to fly an intercept vector, like I said before, and that will bleed off energy from that missile, just like we do when we fly against enemy SAMs that are coming at us. Now, players' first response here is usually when they see an enemy aircraft on their RWR or they see an enemy aircraft on their radar, their first response is to dump their drop tanks. And I highly, highly recommend against that, simply because in a BVR engagement, you're going to want to be using afterburners quite a bit to give yourself as much of an energy advantage over your enemy as possible. And so that's going to use a ton of fuel, and a lot of players will get themselves into a very fuel-critical situation within the very first engagement they find when they're trying to go out and fly a mission. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. So only drop those drop tanks when you know all the fuel is gone out of them. So we're just flying out here that Su-27 is increasing his distance, or sorry, decreasing his distance to us, getting ready to try and lock us up. Now keep in mind here, the RWR symbol for a Su-27 and a MiG-29 is both going to be 29 because they use the exact same radar, so they show up as the same on an RWR scope in a Western aircraft. Alright, so he's 45 miles out. Always keeping uh, aware of where that enemy is through your radar and through AWACS calls is incredibly, incredibly important. It'll always help keep you building and maintaining that situational awareness of what's going on around you. We'll just hit the afterburners a little bit, give ourselves a little bit more energy. Alright, so he's got us in a single target track or a hard lock on us right now. And we're gonna wait for him to launch that missile. There it is. There's the missile launch. So what we're gonna do here is we are going to wait for this rocket motor to burn out um, and then we're gonna initiate our crank. Now you're thinking, Spud, what's a crank? I don't, I don't know what a crank is. And as we're flying this direction, what we're gonna do is we're gonna crank the aircraft around almost 180 degrees, probably more closer to about 140 degrees. As we fly the aircraft in our heading here, we're going to bring the aircraft around this direction and we're gonna fly out towards a more or less this kind of heading coming out here. So more or less a 060 heading coming out of that crank. And what that's gonna do is this missile is first gonna be flying an intercept vector out here to try and intercept us where the radar and the avionics inside the Su-27 is predicting we're going to be. But if we reverse that trend and we bring it back around this direction, that missile now has to make a big arc to come around this way and now intercept us out this way. And that way we're building up more separation, we're increasing the distance that missile has to fly by now flying out this direction, and that incredibly high speed of that R27ER, which gets far above 2,000 knots, has to pull quite a bit of Gs in order to make that turn to come around this direction. And so it's going to bleed off a ton of energy as a result. With air-to-air -air missiles and BVR combat, if you can get that enemy air-to-air -air missile that's being shot at you under 1,000 knots, you've pretty much beat it. Unless you do something unwise, such as turning right back into that missile and giving it a very, very clear shot right direct down to you. And so keep that in mind here. We also want to make sure that we're being patient. We want to be patient, 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 patient. We don't want to simply initiate our crank right away and go whoop and come right around to that 0, 060 0 degree uh, crank heading. We want to actually wait 1-1000, 2-1000, 3-1000, 4-1000, 5-1000 1, because we want this R27's motor to actually burn out before we initiate that crank. Because once that R27 solid rocket motor is burned out, that missile is now relying on its 
kinetic energy to fly out to that target. So it's always losing energy. If we initiate that crank too early while that rocket motor is still burning, it will give the missile an advantage and help it come around this path to come and intercept us out here. So keep that in mind. We want to make sure that this rocket motor is burned out before we start any maneuvering. I also talked about this in my SAM evasion tutorial, which is of course linked down in the description below. So go ahead and check that out and uh, we'll help explain some of these things as well. So let's go ahead and initiate one, two, three, four, five. All right, that's a little agonizing waiting for that. We're gonna bring it on around to that zero six zero. Making sure we don't black out, making sure we don't rip our wings off. And there we go. As we came through on into that zero six zero heading, we went ahead and we notched the SU-27's radar. So what that means is a Doppler radar, such as that in an SU-27, has a look down, shoot down capability. And so what that means is the radar itself is looking at that ground and is trying to look for things that are moving across the ground, uh, such as an aircraft. And if that speed of that aircraft goes down below a certain threshold, usually around 200 knots to 100 knots for most Doppler radars, that radar will disregard that contact and as a result, it will break that STT lock and will go ahead and trash this missile as a result. So why does it do that? Well, it when we fly into this crank coming around through that almost 140 degree turn, when we hit around this area here, right here, where we make that turn, for a split second there, there's going to be almost no relative movement between our SU-27 and our aircraft. Because I know you guys are thinking, well, Spud, your F-14 is flying about 500 knots. So it's nowhere near that 200-ish uh, knot threshold for the Doppler radar. Well, when you hit that and you fly around that turn, the relative motion between the SU-27 and our F-14 is going to drop drastically, almost down to zero, which means that that Doppler radar on that SU-27 is now going to disregard that uh, contact and therefore it's going to drop the lock, it's going to trash that missile. So when we crank the aircraft around here in against these semi-active radar guided missiles, we're getting our, giving ourselves a twofer. We're giving ourselves two chances to trash that missile. Either through uh, kinematics, through degrading the energy state of this R27R that's coming at us, or simply by notching the radar of the SU-27. So it's definitely the best tactic, in my opinion, even better than terrain masking, because it gives us that twofer. We can break that lock through the Doppler effect of the SU-27's radar, as well as bleed that energy of that R-27, and keep us at a higher altitude, which gives us a better chance to then turn back around onto the offensive and hopefully splash that bandit that's trying to kill us. Now, as this guy is closing the distance here, he's flying really fast at us and getting ready to shoot a second missile. So at this point, he's getting pretty close. He's only he's within 20 nautical miles. And when, when you're within 20 nautical miles of a bandit within BVR combat, cranking is no longer an option because cranking will simply bring you closer and closer into this bandit, which then he can switch to his R-73s and shoot you down with an IR guided missile or even get into a merge and get into a dogfight and shoot you down with guns, R-73s, what have you. As well as the simple fact that if we crank, we're bringing ourselves closer to a second missile launch that could come out and hit us, giving that missile an energy advantage. So within 20 nautical miles, what we want to do is we actually want to run away from the missile, basically. So if he were to shoot a second R-27 out here uh, within the next uh, few minutes here, or a few seconds really, Instead of cranking around back to the inside and bringing it back through the inside here closer to this SU-27, I'm actually going to do the opposite. I'm going to come around to my right hand side. I'm going to crank this way, coming around out to the back, extending the range that that missile has to fly. Even though he's still flying at us uh, very, very far, his original launch point, we want to make sure that we're increasing the distance between that original launch point of the next R-27 and our current position now. We want to come this way around the right hand side and increase that distance between us. Now hopefully you've got a wingman around here who can help shoot a missile at him and get him on the defensive so that way he's not just chasing you for miles and miles and miles across the Nevada desert here. But uh, for this demonstration this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to come around to the right and we're going to increase that distance for this next missile launch for that Su-27.
So here we are, we're back in the office and let's unpause it and get started. And this is where that afterburner really comes into play. And we wanna make sure that we are not now let's bring it in back in a little bit more offensive. Give that SU-27 a chance to lock us up. There we go. Let's take a look at the F-10 map. He hasn't launched yet, so we'll keep it going on this direction. Nope, still hasn't launched yet. Not sure why we're getting launch signals. Keep in mind that the Tomcat's RWR system is a little bit older and not the best. It does get a little confused sometimes. And there's a launch, so we're gonna go ahead and bring it around this direction, increasing the distance between our two aircrafts. Missile, six o'clock, And we're now currently at another heading, increasing that distance between the missiles. And we can see that missile is now trashed, coming off in this direction. I don't believe he had a good lock on our tart on us, and was never actually guiding that missile, but it is still a valid example as to what we would want to do with that missile coming out here at us this way. We want to bring the aircraft around in this direction, making sure that he is not able to bring us around this way and thus decreasing the energy state of that missile itself. So with that in mind, I hope you guys have learned something on how to evade and defeat semi-active radar guided missiles. So let's go ahead and take a look at active radar guided missiles. We're gonna take a look at two flavors of active radar guided missiles. The SD-10 carried by the JF-17, and of course the AIM-120C AMRAAM carried by modern Western aircraft such as the uh, F-16C Viper and the F-A-18 Hornet. Alrighty guys, here we are in our awesome little F-16C Fighting Falcon, painted in the Greek Ghost paint scheme, getting ready to get started with our second engagement here, teaching you guys how to evade and defeat active radar guided missiles. For this first run here, we're going to be flying against an F-A-18 armed with four AIM-120C AMRAMs painted in the VFC-12 ambush paint scheme to look like a SU-34 fullback. We can see he's got four AIM-120Cs there, and he is, of course, going up to a higher altitude to give his missiles some better performance here on the Caucasus map. Now, this is going to increase the complexity and the toughness of evading these missiles as we start to engage with these uh, AIM-120C AMRAMs. Keep in mind, there are some differences here between the AI, the way it flies and the way it engages, and the way multiplayer uh, servers or multiplayer missions would work against human players launching active radar guided missiles. The biggest difference is here in uh, single player with AI, the active radar guided missile launching aircraft is actually going to put you into an STT lock for a very short moment as he launches those missiles. I believe this was added in there by Eagle Dynamics as a way to make it, I guess, quote unquote, more, more fair for players in single player to give them a little bit of warning when those active radar guided missiles are shot. And in multiplayer, you're not going to get that same warning the way you would in single player because most multiplayer pilots are not going to put you into a single target track uh, hard lock when they fire an active radar guided missile. They're simply going to get you into a, a TWS or track well scan soft lock launch that missile and help track that missile out to you. That missile is going to go active and, of course, go ahead and try to hit you that way. However, um, it does serve as a very, very good way to train for multiplayer because it gives you an idea of what ranges uh, players in multiplayer are going to actually launch those missiles from. Now, this is not 100% perfect, but it does give you a very good idea of when you should start your cranking, when you should start going on defensive, and all this kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and hop into the office and get started. Just like before, we will be pausing it at periods along the engagement to talk about what's happening and help explain to you guys and illustrate things for you guys to help just get you guys get a very big picture because this is a incredibly complex and dynamic topic that just requires a lot of practice and a lot of learning to get right. All right, so we're in our office here and we know our bandits are out there at a heading of 127. We just got told by Over Overlord they're out there. And what I want to do here is I want to 
Whoop, we got our autopilot on still. We want to make sure that we get our aircraft into twiz mode. We want to look out here and we want to make sure that we're getting things ready to go. We want to bring our scan down to a three, 30 degree arc, and we want to go for a three bar scan here in the F-16. This is what I found to be, to work the best for most people. Keep in mind here that AWACS uh, contacts on the F-16, they all appear friendly, um, but we will go ahead and IFF interrogate this guy as we get closer and closer. Now, you may be asking yourself, Spud, why are you in full burner climbing up to uh, the heavens? So, at this moment, the our opponent in the F-18, even though he's AI, is doing the exact same thing. We can even see he's contrailing. So the higher and higher you go, the less and less dense the air is, of course. And that gives your missiles a much, much better performance. You can launch a missile a lot farther at high altitude because it doesn't have as much air to push through to get out to you. And as a result of that, that's why missiles loft, is because they're trying to get to a higher altitude to less dense air to go and fly out a longer distance to try and hit their target. Because they have much, much less air to push through, there's not as much friction against that air, there's not as much, all these kinds of things that allow the missile to fly farther and retain energy for a longer time. So we're going to go ahead, come up here and match that. The AI usually flies for about 35,000 feet in these long range BVR engagements. Now our F-16 radar really isn't able to pick up any targets and really track any targets unless they're within, uh, I would say about 70 nautical miles is where I have the best success. And we kind of know where they are, so we're going to go ahead and bring our nose off to the right here. Let's go ahead and check in with the AWACS. All right, so our aircraft is automatically interrogated, our F-18 opponent out here, and he now is showing up as a hostile. All right, so that's the AWACS that he just gave us a bra to. And we are now building up that lateral separation. So let's go ahead and take a look at the F-10 map. And we can see that this F-18, he is going to be flying that nose-on pure pursuit to us that the AI likes to fly. But we are flying out in a more or less this direction out here. And we are going to be building up that lateral separation. So that way, when he fires his first salvo of AIM-120Cs, they will be flying out here on an intercept vector. And we can go ahead and crank on into them coming this way and bring those missiles out this way just the same way we did with those semi-active radar guided missiles and bleed off their energy and defeat them that way. The same principles apply to active radar guided missiles but the increased complexity comes with the fact that you're not going to get a warning in multiplayer when they're launched. So as a result we always have to be defensive minded when it comes to um, engaging in BVR combat against aircraft like FA-18Cs, MiG-29Cs, um, F-16Cs, JF-17s, and the like. So this is why it's very, very important to understand and study your enemies within DCS World. Because we should know that an FA-18, if we get an FA-18 spike and he's on the red side, we should know that he's probably armed with AMRAMs and we should be ready to be on the defensive as soon as possible after launching our missiles at him because we know that he's probably got missiles coming after us at the more or less the same ranges. Once again, we're holding on to our drop tanks because we still have fuel in them, and we're going to be using the burner quite a bit. We'll go ahead and set up our countermeasures programs and get our JMAX turned on. And we'll go ahead and bring this down to a one bar, and we can see if we can pick them up on radar. And we can pick up him on radar, so we do have him on radar, and we can see here, based on our HUD, and this line pointing to our enemy aircraft here, he is 27 degrees off of our nose, off this way. And of course, with our joint humble mounted queuing system, we can actually see that box out there right now, giving us some increased situational awareness, which is super, super key in a BVR fight. He's currently 50 miles out. 
He's hot on me, of course. We'll go ahead and plug the burners again and get some more airspeed. Now we're also going to add another thing to our crank when we crank around on this enemy aircraft when he fires these missiles. Is we're actually going to decrease our altitude quite rapidly to drag those missiles down into far more dense air down to that cold snowy mountain sound below us and that way they'll have a lot thicker air to have to push through and that will increase their drag and make sure that those missiles are bleeding energy even more uh, effectively for us. All right, so there's our first launch on us and we can look on our screen here, our F-10 map, and we can see he has launched an AIM-120C. And just like before with those semi-active radar guided missiles, we're going to want to wait a few seconds to let that rocket motor from that AIM-120 actually burn out before we start our crank. And we can actually see here that this AI is actually cranking off himself and we can learn from that. We can see that he is coming off from the missile and he is going defensive because he knows I'm an F-16 and I'm probably carrying active radar guided missiles so he's going right on the defensive which is right exactly what he should be doing and exactly what we would be doing had we been flying in a more active position and launching missiles at him. So one, two, three, four, and five. That, those, that agonizing wait and we're going to go ahead and bring our jet on down into a lower altitude, dragging that missile down and down and down into more and more dense air. We did break our lock, but that's all right. We can get it back. And we can see exactly where our opponent is out here now because he's now contrailing. So we can see that is our enemy FA-18. And why don't we go ahead and take a look at the F-10 map and look at where that AIM-120 is. So that AIM-120 is still has about 11 miles to go and he's already down to 1,205 knots. So that missile is probably more or less trash. We're not gonna have to worry about this missile. But what we are gonna have to worry about is this initial missile was to put us on the defensive and now he's gonna keep pushing out at, on us and launching more and more missiles as we get closer and closer here. So we're now at that point where we're almost 20 nautical miles out, and just like we did before, instead of turning and cranking and coming closer and closer and closer to that enemy F-18, we're gonna have to start coming and cranking around to the back and increasing the distance between our F-18's launch point for those subsequent missiles and increasing that flight time for those missiles and bleeding off energy that way. And we're gonna be cranking the opposite direction, coming this way and this way and this way. And this is when you can actually go for that ground, go for those, um, those uh, mountains, those valleys, and that's why BVR combat on the Caucasus can be so much fun is because there are a heck of a lot of places to hide and get some nice terrain masking going. So this missile out here, is you, we don't really have to worry about too much. And of course, when you're playing on a multiplayer server, you're not getting any RWR indications like this, and you're not getting any kinds of um, dot labels to help you out. You just have to know this by instinct and it requires a lot, a lot of practice within single player to get an idea of those ranges at which those missiles are probably going to be fired and when you should go defensive and when you should start cranking around and trying to evade missiles that you believe are probably coming at you. So let's go ahead and continue. And we can see that this missile here is, of course, definitely trashed. It's starting to fall behind. It's not even going to be start tracking us. And let's try and go back a little more, a bit more on the offensive. And there we go. That's a second launch from that F-18. We can see he's launched another AIM-120. And at this point we're gonna need to go and start cranking off back to the backfield and coming back around this way in order to increase the distance from that launch point. We wanna always be increasing the distance from the launch point of that missile to make sure that it has as long of a flight time and as long of a distance to cover as possible. Yeah, 
And of course, as you're cranking around, you want to make sure you are putting out some chaff. And we can look at the F10 map to give you guys a little illustration. And we can see this 120 is going pretty darn fast, but he is not tracking us very well. And it looks like he was actually fooled by the chaff that we released out in this area and is not going to be a threat to us anymore. And we can see that we have an active missile on us from our back quarter here. And we can see that first missile is now falling down to the ground harmlessly. And that second missile is now not tracking us and coming off to this direction here. Now, how can we know that this missile here, even with these dot labels, is not tracking us? Is simply because that missile has relative motion to us. It's coming off to the left here, which means it's no longer tracking. Just as I explained in the SAM evasion tutorial, if that missile, if you can see it and it's sliding left or right on your canopy, that means it's not tracking. But if it's staying stationary on your canopy, like say it was stuck right here and it was staying there, no matter what we did in terms of maneuvering our aircraft, we would know that that missile is still tracking us and is definitely still a threat. So let's go ahead and keep continuing here. And we're going to go ahead and try to build more lateral separation from that F-18 that's now chasing us by bringing us over into uh, about 240 heading. There we go, 240. And now he's launching a third missile. And so we can see he will be launching a third missile in a second. We'll go ahead and increase the altitude and give this guy a chance to actually launch on us for the purposes of this video. And we'll bring it around a little bit more offensive and see if we can bait him into launching on us. There we go. And there's another launch. So because we are within that very critical distance of 20 nautical miles with our aircraft. Oh geez, we're only within 14 nautical miles. We are gonna wanna crank, come this direction just for a little bit more, make sure that rocket motor of that AIM-120 is of course burned out. Then we're gonna come around off to this direction, off towards Odors, Bonkajis, whatever uh, town that is, and come around this direction, increasing that distance, making that missile have to make turns and bleed off that energy and pull Gs. Of course, we are pushing out chaff and flare, and we're going to bring it down. Make sure that missile is chasing us into denser and denser air. We'll check the F-10 map once again here, and we can see that missile is pretty darn close to us, and he's getting pretty darn fast. So we're going to want to make sure that we crank once again coming off to the left here, uh, making sure that that missile is no longer going to hit us and is no longer a threat because it's getting pretty darn close. And we can see that missile just got fooled by that chaff in that last notch there and is now coming off and has relative motion across our canopy so we know that it is no longer tracking us. We're getting low on chaff. Probably not a good situation to be in right here. And we can see that F-A-18, he is definitely pushing the pursuit and coming after us. And it looks like we got another missile coming after us, so we're gonna go ahead and bring it off into a this direction, into a westerly heading and see if we can fool the missile this way. We have it, he's actively guiding on us, as we can see that M that is on here, it stands for a missile that's actively guiding on us. And we're bringing that chaff out. Always making sure that missile is guiding on us. And now it has relative motion on our canopy, and that now we have trashed all of those AIM-120s. We can see two AIM-120s in our field of view here. We got one here. He's falling harmlessly to the ground. This one's still got some energy, but he has actually went off for some flares and probably got fooled by our crank. 
and we can see that relative energy no longer a threat. He is falling harmlessly to the ground. And now our opponent up here, our FA-18 opponent, no longer has any missiles, and we can go ahead and go offensive on him, merge, and shoot him down. So let's go ahead and take a look at flying against SD-10s, which is another challenge all of in itself. So let's go ahead. Okay guys, here we are on a nice clear morning on the Persian Gulf for at least as clear as it can possibly get in this part of the world in our beautiful VMFA-232 FA-18C Hornet. Now in this engagement, we're going to talk about evading and defeating the SD-10 missile as fired from the JF-17 Thunder here in DCS World. Now keep in mind with this engagement, everything we talked about in the previous engagement in terms of evading and defeating active radar guided missiles certainly applies, such as practicing in single player and getting that momentary RWR warning when they fire a missile at you to give you an idea of the ranges at the moments at which uh, players will fire their missiles in multiplayer, but in multiplayer you simply won't have that warning on your RWR due to having a soft TWS lock on you, as well as the actual tactics you use to evade those missiles once they're flying through the air. Now the SD-10 presents a particular challenge because of the blistering speeds at which it flies through the air coming at you. It flies in excess of 2,500 knots at very, very high altitudes and will be on top of you in no time at all, making it a very hard missile to actually evade. And because of that, those usual kind of cranking tactics we've been using in the two previous uh, engagements here will not work for us quite as well for us. So let's take a look at the F-10 map and kind of illustrate it for you. In our previous engagements here, we've been using the cranking method of flying out, building that lateral separation from our enemy here, and then once he fires a missile at us and it's flying that intercept vector to come out and get us, we reverse the turn and bring it on out towards this direction. The SD-10 flies so fast and it retains so much energy that this is a untenable tactic against the SD-10. Once we fly out and we're building that separation from that JF-17 and he fires that SD-10, we have to go completely cold and go completely defensive and turn all the way back around and bring him out this way to increase the range at which that missile has to fly and fly away from that missile and crank out this direction, coming out completely cold away from that JF-17, putting us obviously completely defensive. Now, for the purposes of our demonstration here, we're going to show what this looks like, but in real life, this is a terrible tactic to use against the JF-17 because that first missile, while you may evade it, the follow-up shots will be incredibly dangerous. In this demonstration here, we're probably going to get shot down, but it really illustrates just how deadly and effective the JF-17 in conjunction with the SD-10 can be. Now, keep in mind when you're in a multiplayer server or you're in a multiplayer mission and there's JF-17 pilots on the other side, you will be engaged by SD-10s. It is the best means of self-defense those JF-17 pilots have available to them. Their IR-guided short-range PL-5 missile is no good in the forward aspect, not very good in the side aspect, and okay in the rear aspect, but it's incredibly easy to spoof with flares. Their jet itself is not very maneuverable and can be easily outflown in BFM by the FA-18C, F-16C, and F-14. And so those pilots want to keep you out away from them as far as possible and make sure that you do not close close and merge with them. So here, when we're flying against JF-17s, we want to try and get rid of those missiles, defeat those SD-10s, and try and force that merge if possible. Because if we get a JF-17 into the merge, you have a very high probability of being able to down that pilot and continue on with your mission, whether that's a strike or a cap, fighter sweep, whatever it is. So let's go ahead and hop into the office and get started with this mission. All right, so Magic has already given us a bra call for 308 for 25. We'll go ahead and kick off the autopilot. Keep in mind here that the radar in the FA-18, similar to the F-16C, is not very effective out past 80 nautical miles. I think that is a more effective radar than what is in the F-16C, but uh, still you're going to have a hard time finding those targets out there past 80 nautical miles. And that's where the SA page can really, really help up your situational awareness as to what threats are out there for you to uh, look out for. 
So we're going to keep this guy off of our nose just a little bit, making sure that we have him at least 20 degrees off our nose. So we'll fly at a heading of 325 to build that lateral separation if possible. And we can see a PPLI for that JF-17 down here on our essay page. We'll fly up here to 30,000 feet and we'll level it off just as we've been doing for that last engagement against those AMRAMs. Now the one thing we have working for us here is the, P the SD-10 missile made by the Chinese doesn't have quite as advanced of avionics and a little radar set that's inside of it. And so it is easy to spoof with flares and it gets confused in ground clutter. So our best tactic is to get low, get into the ground clutter, pump out as much chaff as we possibly can and try to get rid and spoof those missiles and trash them and get them off of us as quickly as we possibly can. We're gonna go ahead and put our radar into bias mode here. We're gonna go for a four bar scan and see if we can pick this guy up as quickly as we possibly can. Just to increase our SA, we're gonna go into air to air mode and get our joint helmet mounted queuing system on. We'll come back to our EW page in BVR, having this EW page up in your F-18 is incredibly important and will definitely be able to help keep you aware of any threats that are around you. Even though we have it on our HUD, this gets very cluttered and very hard to interpret in the thick of things. So we do have him on radar. We'll do a manual mode for interrogation. We got him here and we'll go ahead and give him into a soft lock and we can see him off of our nose right there. He's 25 degrees off of our nose and we'll go ahead and leave him there. Now keep in mind here that uh, in multiplayer, because JF-17 pilots are going to want to protect themselves as best they possibly can, they're probably going to fire at least one ST-10 at you all the way out here at 60 nautical miles, and it can still be a deadly missile out to that range. Here in single player, the AI will usually fire at around between 40 and 30 nautical miles. I even have players in multiplayer fire at me at a 50 nautical mile range as well. So just be ready to turn cold and run away from these SD-10s at whatever range you are at from that target. So we'll keep them 25 degrees off our nose. getting close to 30 nautical miles. He should be launching on us pretty soon. There we go. There he goes. There's the launch. We'll pump out some chaff right away and we'll get started into our uh, crank around to turn cold and bring it back on this way back to the direction we came from. So this missile is an incredibly quick missile as we can see. So let's go ahead. We can see that missile. It's already at 2000 knots and it just came off his rail practically. So let's take a look at that missile itself and we can see that it is going quite fast and it literally just came off the rail. And so we need to keep in mind here that this missile is going to, the rocket motor is gonna burn for a long time to get it up to those blistering speeds we talked about. So we're not gonna wait, we're not gonna wait that five seconds in order to let that rocket motor burn out. We're gonna actually crank and go around and get away from this missile as quickly as we can because this missile just flies so fast, we have literally no time to waste. We want to get into this ground clutter as quickly as we possibly can. And we can see our old contrail from up there. And we should be able to see our bandits contrail pretty quickly coming up. We're going to keep pumping out some chaff and we'll bring ourselves around towards this direction, and we'll go ahead and take a look at the F-10 map again to see what's happening with that missile. 
We can see that missile is still coming up on us, and man, it is still going 1,733 knots. Down here, we are traveling at 663 knots of true airspeed, and we're gonna try and hug this ridge coming around here and get off into the ground clutter up on this ridge as effectively as we possibly can to get rid of this SD-10 that's coming at us. It's an incredibly effective missile because of simply how fast it flies. And we can see a little dot out there representing the missile. And we'll go ahead and bring it on out this direction. And now it's gone active back here behind us. There it is. And we'll go ahead and bring it on back this direction a bit more. And we can see it's still tracking. And we'll go ahead and take a look at it again just to give you guys a little representation. Okay, it's down to 633 knots. It's still tracking, but it's not gonna hit us. We need to make sure that we take our minds off of this and get our minds back onto our JF-17, who will bring up a pretty rapid follow-up shot on us. We can see the range between our two aircraft is very, very low and is gonna be dropping more and more and more as this guy is flying very fast at us at 865 knots. Our slow little Hornet here is definitely at a disadvantage and we're gonna try and run for these hills as much as we possibly can. Yep, that missile is now sliding back on my canopy, so I know that it is, in fact, no longer tracking. You want to always think that that guy is already shooting a missile at us, so we want to fly as if he's already foxed a missile at us. And we'll go ahead and come on over towards this mountain range. We want to get up and over this mountain range, hopefully break his lock on us, and see if we can force a merge. That would be the best tactic for us to work with here. We can see he hasn't fired a follow-up shot here, but he's definitely closing that gap, and it's not looking good for us. Going fully passive against JF-17s like this and fully defensive is not going to be a good day. You always want to make sure you have teammates working with you, squadron mates, whether they're AI or humans in multiplayer, helping you out against this JF-17. We can see his contrail out there. He's still coming at us. He hasn't fired a shot yet. Looks like a good valley to come through this mountain range through. We can see his contrail still up there. He's still hot on us. He knows he, ha he has us dead to rights. But we're going to try as hard as we possibly can. There we go. There's that follow-up shot we were worried about. Pumping out as much chaff as we possibly can. And that missile's gonna get us. Let's take a look. So that we did in fact trash that missile by that last ditch effort to get around this guy, and yet we've got another new missile coming at us. So we're gonna wanna bring this guy around here. We're pumping out as much chaff as we possibly can. And I don't think it's gonna go well for us. Yep, there it is. So you can see just how effective those ST-10s are, and it just completely blew our Hornet apart. There was no way we could get away from it at that point. And we can see our victorious JF-17 doing a victory dance as he flies away. So it's incredibly, incredibly important to make sure that you're keeping those JF-17s on the defensive whenever you're trying to evade these missiles. You can probably evade the first one, two, maybe three, but that last follow-up shot, if he keeps pressing on you, is really going to get you. Flying one-on-one -on -one against these SD-10s is never a good idea. Okay guys, here we are, back over the Cox's map and back in the cockpit of our F-14B Tomcat. 
At this point in the BVR engagement, you have done a fantastic job. You have evaded and defeated all of the AIM-7 Sparrows, R-27s, R-77s, AIM-120 AMRAMs, or SD-10 missiles the enemy could launch at you. At this point, you and your remaining wingmen are trying to force a merge to get your opponent into a BFM situation so you can down them with your remaining AIM-9 Sidewinders or your gun. I know personally, at this point in the fight, I'm sweating, I'm gripping onto the controls, my hands are shaking from all the adrenaline pumping, as well as I keep glancing at my fuel gauge, very worried about how much gas I have and whether or not I can even participate in this dogfight after this merge. And then what happens? That enemy, that opponent coming at you in that merge launches a forward aspect firing IR guided missile at you like an AIM-9 Sidewinder or an R-73 or an R-60. And what do you do? You get caught during the headlights. I see a lot of players try to yank back on the stick to, to break the aircraft up, break to the right, break to the left, break down, and every time they either overg the aircraft or they simply just get hit by that missile and do not get to participate in that merge and then the subsequent dogfight as a result. And so we want to make sure that we can pass through that merge and get into that dogfight intact and be able to down that opponent in a very fun and very cool dogfight. And so we want to avoid that deer in the headlights moment and that reactional jerk of the stick. And in my opinion, the best way to do that is to fly a big looping barrel roll around the missile coming at you. That is to get as many control surfaces on that missile deflecting as absolutely possible in order to get the missile to A, put more G's on the missile to bring the energy of that missile down, as well as to, as those control surfaces deflect, it's going to add, add drag to that missile and make it so that that missile is also losing energy in that way. And as we're going through that entire big looping barrel roll around that missile coming at you, you're going to be popping flares, a whole bunch of flares, and hopefully that missile seeker head will go after one of those flares and you have two things going for you, bleeding off that missile energy of that Sidewinder of that R-73, as well as confusing that seeker head with your flares. Now, this tactic is not going to be very useful against the AIM-9X. That AIM-9X is very, very uh, able to get penetrate through those flares and not get confused due to its imaging seeker head that actually looks for heat-seeking images um, of aircraft themselves, as well as um, its thrust vectoring technology makes it so that it's not as susceptible and its very small control surfaces reduce the amount of drag its deflection of those control surfaces create themselves. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and hop back into the office of our F-14 and get started here. We do have a uh, Venezuelan FAV F-16A out in front of us loaded with some AIM-9 mics ready to shoot us down so let's take a look at him it's a very cool little F-16 uh, skin on here uh, representing the Venezuelan Air Force and we'll go ahead and get started with this merge. I will also open up the controls indicator so you guys can take a look at how I'm moving these controls to do this big looping roll around that missile to evade it. So let's go ahead and uh, continue on. Okay, we're on. Target, 13 miles. We always want to make sure we're building that lateral separation. We never want to fly directly at our enemy, even as we're getting close to the merge, especially if he has forward aspect firing missiles. Missile, 12 o'clock. Hot. Break right. And we're bringing it on around. We're bringing G's onto the jet, onto the missile, and we made it through. And we'll be able to fly into the merge and get around and kill this guy. Now this is an excellent AI that we're now dogfighting at the moment, but keep in mind here that human players will undoubtedly launch that missile a lot closer and a lot closer range to you. And you'll have to be ready to make that looping barrel roll maneuver at any time as you're flying into that merge. It could be five miles out, it could be less than a mile out. This point in the engagement, I am 
really wigging out, man. That adrenaline is flowing. And there's a Fox 2. And there's a miss. My hands are shaking. I'm sweating. I'm worried about my fuel situation. But I'm also now in a dogfight with this guy. So I have to down him before I can leave to get gas from a tanker. Or get home to refuel and rearm. And there's another Fox 2. And that's going to be another miss. Alright, we're down to guns. Let's see if we can get him. And we got him. That was probably a perfect pilot snipe. Yep, that's exactly what it was. And that works just as effectively as anything else. So there you have it. A guide on how to go defensive and evade various types of air-to-air -air missiles in BVR combat high above the valleys of the Caucasus or the deserts of the Persian Gulf. I hope it gives you more confidence the next time you see a spike on your RWR and gives you the tools to evade the missiles that have been fired at you. Whether you're flying a single player campaign or trying to get some revenge on those guys who keep beating up on you on a public multiplayer server. Also keep in mind here that this takes a lot of practice. Definitely use the techniques you saw me use in this video. Turn on the dot labels, look at the F-10 map, look at the speeds of the missiles, their current headings, your current heading versus the current heading of the launch aircraft, and take a look at what's actually going on around you. Also definitely use TACView. TACView is a great tool to actually look at and see what happened in your flights. Why did you die that time? Why didn't you die that time? Why did you get that kill? Why didn't he get that kill? Those kind of things. In the next video, we will discuss BVR tactics and how to stay on the offensive throughout the engagement and make the other guy go defensive and do what we had to do throughout this entire video. I think we should do a lot better against those JF-17s and their pesky SD-10s. Thanks for watching and please give us a like and a subscribe and please consider supporting us on Patreon. It's our supporters who make this channel possible and I'm really thankful for all the contributions you guys make. So thanks a lot guys and of course fly safe.